Uh, my name is uh, John Mankins. I'll be your master of ceremonies for today's luncheon. Uh, our uh, speaker this afternoon uh, is um, Michael Lopez uh, Alegria. 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 Did I ma mangle it sufficiently? I apologize, sir. <laughs> like, oh, fine. Excellent. Thank you. It's LA. So, uh, Michael L.A. This is the wrong town for that. <laughs> um, uh, we'll also be presenting uh, a, a Space Pioneer Award and a Bain Books Award uh, this afternoon. So um, I'd like to uh, first, I, I make the assumption many of you are, uh, know who I am, uh, just a little background. So I, I worked at NASA for a number of years, about 25 years. Uh, if you've ever worked with uh, the technology readiness levels, I wrote the definitions. Um, I'm sorry for those who hate them. And <laughs> Uh, and and uh, these days I do a lot in space solar power, which I'll be talking more about in just a few moments. I'd like to recognize the, um, the sponsor of today's luncheon, Space Canada. Uh, unfortunately, the president... Oh, oh, thank you. Un unfortunately, George Dietrich, the president of Space Canada, sends his regrets. He was not able to be with us today. Uh, he uh, got uh, uh, hung up in his law office yesterday, which is why he couldn't make the banquet last evening. And then when he tried to rearrange things and get a flight to come down crack of dawn this morning, uh, he found that uh, Canada Airlines wanted to charge him $2,500 for a one-way ticket. <laughs> so he said he's sorry. <laughs> but even though the rubber chicken at the Grand Hyatt is really, really good, <laughs> It's not $2,500 worth of goods. So, and I, I think it was, a, I, I told him it's a really good decision. <laughs> um, so he, he sends his apologies. Um, uh, just to talk a little bit about what Space Canada does, it's, it's an organization that was founded, it's a non-governmental organization in Canada to promote international dialogue on the topic of space solar power. Uh, and uh, I was uh, speaking earlier today to a reporter, and I don't know if he's here, uh, from uh, German radio, uh, from a German radio program. And uh, he said that uh, it's really a shame that so little is going on in space solar power this year. He was quite uh, uh, certain that nothing was happening. And I thought I would just take a moment and recount the things that have happened this year, which I went through with him to say how much is happening rather than how little. So uh, although there are a number of, of things that didn't happen, uh, for example, there's no big U.S. national initiative on space solar power, which is a great shame. Another thing that didn't happen this year is that the ongoing technology program in space solar power in Japan was not canceled. So there was, it was on the verge of being canceled. Yeah, it's a good thing. <laughs> it was on the verge of being canceled uh, uh, because of the, um, the, the terrible tragedy in Fukushima Daiichi. Northeastern Japan had the horrible earthquake on March 11th of last year. I happened to be at uh, Tokyo Narita Airport at the moment of the earthquake, uh, which I have to say, if you've ever been, uh, just to give you a feeling for what a, t 100 miles away from a Richter 9.0 earthquake, what that feels like, if you've ever been in an aircraft in heavy turbulence where the, the, the stewardesses or the attend flight attendants start to fall down and the, and the captain comes online and says, sit down now, you know, everybody sit down and the flight attendants take your seats, that's what it was like. But it was the whole island, and it was hundreds of thousands of tons of building and runway and aircraft. Aircraft are boun bouncing up and down outside the windows. And it, and it went on for about a minute plus. I have some video of, of, that was shot by a gentleman with a, a camera, with a cell phone camera. Uh, the language is a little colorful. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're welcome to see it if, if we get a chance. Um, and a really remarkable thing, because there's a lot of criticism of the, the engineering at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear complex, but at Tokyo Narita, I can say with authority, uh, with all of that, boom, bounce for a minute, full minute, not a crack in a window, not a crack in a wall, not a crack in a runway. And it was amazing how well engineered the whole Tokyo Narita uh, complex was. So um, just, just a, a real tribute to uh, Japanese engineering. Only thing that was really damaged, unfortunately, were the walls in the red carpet club. <laughs> and those, those came off, and so all of us who were flying on United got shooed out into the, uh, into the uh, concourse, which is where we spent the next 24 hours, because uh, they shut off all the electricity, their saving power, shut off the power, the building got really cold. This is early March last year, got really cold overnight, we're all sleeping on the floors. Um, long about 2 or 3 a.m., they got blankets to us. 
Um, now, where does all of this go with space solar power? Well, because of that, of course, uh, Japan has gone through a lot of soul searching about the use of nuclear power there in the islands, and they're thinking about future energy options. There was a lot of public support for space solar power. So even though they were looking around for places to cut the budget for, uh, in science because they have to find money to pay for natural gas to supplant, to supplant the use of nuclear power that they're not doing now, space solar power was not one of the programs that was cut. And so that program is ongoing, ground technology, and they've even started an additional activity to start defining uh, a, a space solar power technology flight experiment to take place in a few years. And uh, as, a, as a shameless promotion, I'll just mention that this and other great topics will be discussed in our uh, mini-track on space solar power this afternoon here at the ISDC starting at 2 o'clock. Um, other things that are going on, uh, there's a, there was a, a big study that was concluded last year by the International Academy of Astronautics, a 10-country, three-year international assessment of space solar power, the first of its kind. Uh, there was a, um, uh, a, uh, um, a new NASA project. Uh, that was started. Uh, this is uh, SPS Alpha, uh, which is a, uh, looking at a new concept for solar power satellites, the first NASA project on space solar power uh, in some uh, nine years, since 2003 or so. Uh, there's a, um, uh, there was a, a new international working group has been formed. Uh, it's got six countries so far and a number of companies and uh, universities and so on. They had their first meeting in March of this year. Uh, and so there are, in fact, a, a wide variety, oh, and I should say, and uh, at the International Astronautical Congress last spring in South Africa, we got for the first time, we got somebody who actually came to the conference, the, the annual symposium on space solar power, and presented on the Chinese program in space solar power. And we discovered that they'd had a, uh, and had a nice report on a 10-year activity on space solar power in China, in which they're looking for a significant ramp up in their activities over the coming several years. Uh, and I have to mention, since I'm here at the National Space Society, and we continue to have an ongoing discussion between NSS and former president of India, um, Abdul Kalam, uh, about a prospective collaboration between the US and India, facilitated by the NSS uh, and Dr. Kalam. So rather than there being nothing going on in space solar power, in fact, there's really a great deal going on in space solar power. And, um, but it's not very, very well known. That's one of the dilemmas. It's not very pe many people know about it. Um, with that, I'll just I'll stop there because I know we're running a little bit behind schedule. And just say again, if you're interested in this subject, we're going to be talking a lot more about it in this afternoon's track. So now I'd like to move on to the uh, awards presentation. Uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, to start with the, um, the uh, Space Pioneer Awards. So, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, the Space Pioneer Awards recognize individuals and teams whose accomplishments have helped to open the space frontier. The awards are divided into a number of categories, such as media, space business, uh, legislators, uh, scientists, and engineers. The intent is to recognize those who have made significant contributions um, to individual fields of endeavor to, quote, develop a spacefaring civilization which will establish communities beyond the Earth. Uh, the award itself is a, a lovely rendering of the moon in pewter created by a noticed art, noted artist Don Davis and produced by the Baker Art Foundry in Placerville, California uh, with a base of uh, and uh, support of uh, brass and a, a very attractive... Um, uh, pyramid at the base. Um, the bases and the brass supports are made by Ma Michael Hall of Studio Foundry of Driftwood, Texas. Uh, the sy symbolic, symbolic choice of the moon um, is, uh, and I'm not going to read what's here because I, I, I just want to say, it, there's, there's no way, frankly, that human humanity is going to move beyond the earth without uh, exploiting properly and fully the object on our doorstep. So I'm a very strong believer in the, uh, in the ultimate return to the moon and its development. And it's obvious <laughs> that the moon should be the symbol for opening the space frontier. Um, so the, uh, you may have, if you came to the gala last night, uh, you would have seen the first two Space Pioneer Awards given uh, to, to giants in space. Uh, um, uh, Senator John Glenn uh, and uh, Commander Scott Carpenter. Our third Space Pioneer Award uh, presented today 
uh, is uh, in the mass media uh, category uh, and is going to uh, Ben Bova. Um, so. Uh, ben Vova has worked as a technical writer, uh, worked as a technical writer for Project Vanguard starting in the 50s. Um, you, you, you must have been in, uh, in middle school at the time. <laughs> uh, and also for uh, Avco Everett Research Laboratory, a great name. Uh, in, uh, uh, in, the in 1972, he became the editor of Analog Science Fiction magazine. Uh, as an avid reader of fantasy and science fiction, that was the other magazine. <laughs> Um, uh, and at Analog, he's, he won six Hugo Awards for Best uh, Professional Editor. After leaving Analog in 1978, uh, he served as editor of Omni from 1978 to 1982. And just as a, a, a yes, as a geek test, I want to do a geek test. How many, how many people in the room can still say they have all of their copies, a full set of Omni in their boxes in their garage? I mean, I, 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 I I will gladly take that test. So it's a small club, but that was a great magazine. Um, he holds a position of uh, pre President Emeritus of the National Space Society uh, and served as the president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America uh, from 1990 to 1992. He earned a Master of Arts in Communications in 1987 and a uh, Doctor of Education uh, from California Coast University in 1996. Uh, he has written over uh, 115 books, nonfiction as well as science fiction, uh, and, um, and I'm sure uh, a much larger group than those who could hold up their hands for Omni uh, can say uh, that they have both read and uh, thoroughly enjoyed his works over the years. So, um, Ben, if you would be so kind as to come up and receive the award. And on the schedule here, you're allowed 12 seconds for comments. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Thank you so much. This is going to take a little bit longer than 12 seconds, but not much. I really deeply appreciate this award, but in a larger sense, you are all space pioneers. You are helping to change the world, and this is the greatest thing that human beings can do. I'd like to read a, a quote from a real rocket pioneer, Robert Goddard, who said, there can be no thought of finishing for aiming at the stars, both literally and figuratively, is a problem to occupy generations, so that no matter how much progress one makes, there is always the thrill of just beginning. There's another quote I'd like to cite. I think it's on the Jefferson Memorial. It says, what is past is prologue. And there's a story about a foreign visitor who didn't quite understand what that meant. And he asked an American nearby, what does that mean? What is past his prologue? And the guy said, oh, oh, that means you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> well, the best is yet to come. We are living in a new era. And you, God bless all of you, are going to help to lead the human race to the stars. Ad Astra. And be very careful if, if you have to fly anywhere with that, because it's really kind of problematic. It looks like a weapon, don't <laughs> It's got sharp edges. <laughs> and it's a large, heavy metal object. And it, going through x-ray or even millimeter wave scanning. OK. Um, I'd like to uh, transition now to the uh, winner of the Jim Bain uh, Memorial Writing Contest, um, uh, uh, which will be um, uh, 
introduced by uh, Tony Daniel, Bain Books uh, Executive Editor. There you are. Yeah, sorry, you're, you're behind the corner from me. Okay, and he'll announce the, um, the winner of the 2012 Jim Bain Memorial Writing Contest. Tony. All right. Uh, well, to see scientists, engineers, and dreamers, and visionaries getting together in a conference like this brings to mind to me a Facebook, Facebook post of a friend of mine from a couple of uh, days ago that I saw. He, uh, his post went this way. The past, the present, and the future walked into a bar. It was intense. Yeah. <laughs> Only this crowd would have even groaned at the, all right. The same thing, I, I think in a lot of ways the same thing might be said about the relationship of science, uh, the future, and science fiction. There's been a big debate for years in science fiction over the very definition of what science fiction writers are up to. Um, are we visionaries of the future, or are we instead really writing about the present, uh, constructing pleasant or unpleasant fairy tales about current reality? Now, to an extent, the latter view has to be correct. Um, after all, we can't know the future. Not really, none of us can. Uh, science fiction must be metaphor for the present, for present attitudes, for present hopes and dreams. This seems obvious on reflection. But is this all that is true about science fiction? Uh, if it is, then why write it at all? Regular fiction, set in the present, does a fine job of conveying the feel of modern life. Why not just stick with that? Why do we write science fiction? A conference like this, I think, gives us at least part of the answer. At the ISDC, we speak about future extensions of technology. We push the boundaries of science as we know it. Um, Above all, we speak of space, of the future, and of the universe that's out there, um, of the means and methods for traveling there, means and methods of discovery, and dare I say it, settlement. Um, behind these means and methods, and behind those charts, graphs, and equations is feeling, and that's what stories are about, human emotion. We anticipate, long for, and perhaps even dread uh, what the future we are planning for, a future that we are at this that we at this conference know is coming um, sooner or later, what it will feel like to be a human in that future, what it will mean to be a human in that future, and retain our humanity. Which is what science fiction, and specifically the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Competition, is all about. It's a contest about looking forward to a realized future. Moon bases, Mars colonies, orbital habitats, space elevators, asteroid minings, maybe artificial intelligence, uh, nanotechnology, uh, realistic spacecraft, heroics, sacrifice, adventure. Our winning entry this year is a wonderful example of these qualities. It's an adventure full of guts, grits, determination, and smarts. It's about a mission to Mars that goes awry and a return to Earth. Uh, return to Earth proves impossible. So what are they going to do? Survival is at stake. And the very human scientists and engineers aboard this spacecraft, which is called Liberty in the, uh, in the story, rise to the, ch to the challenge. The story is called Taking the High Road, and the writer is R.P.L. Johnson. I'd like, to, I'd like to read to you a little bit from the story. It won't be long. Uh, from Richard Johnson's uh, gem of a story. This is from near the end. Uh, after, in the story, after much travail, our spacefarers have found a fascinating solution to their problem. Uh, it's a solution that changes everyone aboard's life in profound ways. Let me just pop it up. Hold on. And, and this is toward the end. I won't give you give away uh, what the solution is, but th they've made it. Look at us now, comet riders and spacefarers, a pocket-sized nation of citizen scientists with a unity of purpose, not seen since we left behind the subsistence farming of medieval village life. And yet, with all of space before us, no longer limited to our fields, our herds, and the banks of our river, we can now take these things with us, and there is no limit to our wanderings. So it's a wonderful story. And take the high road. By the way, if you want to read this story, it will be published on the Bain.com website on June 15th. Uh, it's free, of course, uh, and it will be available at our ebook site, bainebooks.com, as well. 
Uh, RPL Johnson couldn't make it from Australia today, unfortunately, but our able administrator, Bill Ledbetter, has arranged for our runner-up, Martin Shoemaker, whose story, Scramble, was also a great tale. I was one of the judges this year, and uh, Scramble was very close to, you know, it was between these two. Uh, Martin Shoemaker's here to accept for Richard. And I cannot think of a better way to, better way to present the award than a legendary presence in science fiction. We have him today. I don't have to introduce him because he just introduced himself. Uh, from editing Analog and Omni to his great life's work of novels and stories, Ben Bova epitomizes what every Jim Bain Memorial winner is striving to become. A great writer of science fiction and, the, and of the human imagination. Ben's going to present this to Martin. Uh, and by the way, Bain Books is going to have two novels out from Ben early 2014, so look for those. So, Ben, would you do the honors? Thank you. I'm back. <laughs> Robert, good luck. I am incredibly honored to be able to stand here in Richard's stead today. I was very disappointed he could not be here, as he said in his first email to me, tell them to get a clipper ship working, get a commercial space, or space plane going so he can make it next time. <laughs> he plans to be back. He did ask if I could read some remarks for him. First of all, my apologies for not being present to pick up this award in person. A span of 63 years took us from the plains of Kitty Hawk to the Sea of Tranquility. But four decades later, Australia sometimes feels just as far away as it ever was. I would like to thank Bill Ledbetter for administering the fantastic competition, as well as Hank Davids, Davis, Jim Mintz, Tony Daniel, Steve Miller, and all the staff at Bain Books and the National Space Society. The journey into a future of manned space exploration requires ingenuity, will, and imagination, and it is this spirit of exploration and wonder that the Jim Bain Memorial Writing Contest seeks to inspire. It is immensely gratifying to see my story contribute in some small way to such a worthy goal. Ad Astra, Richard Johnson, Melbourne, Australia. Thank you. I am, I am pleased to um, follow the two presentations of awards. Uh, almost exactly back on schedule. We're about one minute past. We started about 12 minutes late, so we've done well. Um, we are privileged today for our luncheon speaker uh, to uh, have a gentleman with a very distinguished background in aerospace, uh, including positions as a naval aviator and test pilot, a NASA astronaut, uh, and an International Space Station commander. Uh, he is Michael Lopez Alegria, President of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. I got it right that time. Um, uh, LA. Uh, received his Bachelor of Science in Systems Engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy and a Master of Science degree uh, in Aeronautical Engineering from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. He is also a graduate of Harvard's uh, Kennedy School of Government uh, for senior ex program for senior executives in national and international security. Uh, and um, is, uh, he speaks uh, not only English but also Spanish, French, and Russian. Uh, a wonderful preparation for uh, the International Space Station. Uh, he has over three decades of experience with the U.S. Navy and uh, with uh, NASA in a variety of roles, um, uh, including ISS Commander, Assistant Director of Flight Crew Operations, etc. Uh, he has flown on space shuttle missions STS-73, 92, and 113 and as commander of ISS Expedition 14, in which he flew to and from uh, the ISS on a Soyuz uh, TMA-9. He holds three NASA spaceflight records, longest spaceflight, 215 days, uh, most number of extravehicular activities uh, at 10, and uh, greatest cumulative EVA time at 67 hours and 40 minutes. Uh, he has most recently served as the assistant for the International Space Station to the director of flight crew operations at the NASA Johnson Space Center uh, in uh, Houston, Texas. 
uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Michael Lopez Alegria uh, to offer his remarks this afternoon. Thank you, John, for that uh, kind uh, welcome. <clears throat> it's very good to be here today. Um, first thing I want to do is congratulate Paul Damfus and his staff on uh, this great conference that you're putting off, uh, pulling off once more on Memorial Day weekend. It's, I, I was um, in a studio today where people are complaining about having to work on Memorial Day weekend, and it's good to be somewhere that you want to be, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> so I. My talk today is going to be uh, a little bit out of, uh, I think, what you might be expecting. Um, the, uh, it's due to a confluence of events, and it has nothing to do with uh, Dragon this time. Um, it has to do with uh, the fact that the theme today seems, about, uh, seems to be about literature and writing. Uh, you would agree that a couple of the um, objectives of that are to educate and to entertain. I'm going to focus a little more on the latter, which is to entertain. So I wanted to try to think about something that um, you might not have uh, heard at this talk and likely will not hear <clears throat> for, the rest of the, uh, for the rest of the conference. Uh, it's an experience that um, is pretty unique. I think nobody else in this room has had it, not my colleague from STS-92, Brian Duffy, and not even the moonwalker, Buzz Aldrin. This is uh, all about launching, uh, training and launching from Russia. So. I am um, going to show you basically some uh, family photos, if you will, some pictures that uh, I took along my uh, journey to train and fly <clears throat> to the ISS and come back. Um, some of them are really nice quality photos that I stole from other people, and some of them are taken with uh, my mobile device. But uh, they, I think they'll show you a, a pretty interesting look into what it's like um, to train there. Um, I. I you know, as a the president of the commercial space flight industry, there's plenty of other things for me to talk about, but um, Paul has lined up enough uh, speakers that you're going to hear about orbital and suborbital flight. You're going to hear about uh, spaceports. In fact, I'm going to take my own moment to make a uh, shameless plug for um, the track that we're sponsoring in Independence B and C. Um, it's going to start at 2 o'clock. We have four panels. Um, the first one is about spaceports, uh, hosted by Jim Ball from Spaceport Services. The second is about launchers, that's hosted by uh, Dr. George Neal from the FAA. The third one about markets, um, by Carissa Christensen from the Towery Group. And lastly, uh, Ken Davidian from the FAA is also going to talk, uh, host a panel uh, about prizes. So please um, join them for that. It'll be very interesting. But back to Russia. <clears throat> So the, um, the, the path to fly on the ISS um, starts with about a two and a half year training template. Um, it's, it's, about, it's a lot shorter now than it used to be. Um, the two and a half years, the first two years of that, you start um, at, at the end of which you should be trained to be a backup. And then the last six months you're concentrating on your prime um, mission, your own mission and any sort of special things that might be going on there. So the Russians have a tradition of always having backups, just as we had um, up until we started flying um, the shuttle. And um, it is, uh, you know, in theory, you could trade out those people up right up until the last day of launch. Um, I'm going to show you some reasons why that might not be practical, um, but, but that is part of the deal. So most of the training in Russia, I hate to say, is pretty boring. It's... Um, it's, it's very theoretical. Uh, they have a, uh, a sort of traditional old school way of teaching and just about down to the slapping your knuckles with the rulers when you make a mistake. <clears throat> and so we spent a lot of time in classroom. Um, let me give you a little bit of a layout of the, of the Soyuz and how, how the crew responsibilities are divided up. So the, the guy in the center seat is a commander. Um, he's always a Russian. But the other two seats could be occupied by Russians or Americans or any of our other partners in the ISS. So it could be Europeans, Canadians, or Japanese. The person in the left seat is a flight engineer, which you could think of as a co-pilot. So that guy has a lot of responsibilities, um, technical responsibilities. And the language level required to fly there is higher than it is in the right seat. So I guess it goes without saying that all of the um, operations on the Soyuz from the time you get in it 
to the time you get out of it, which is two days later, uh, are done in Russian, and the same thing for entry. So you've got to be able to at least understand Russian. Um, I won't go into the, the technical details of the, of the language scale, but you've had to have a higher um, ability to do that, to speak the language in order to be considered for training. And not surprisingly, that's a pretty tall order for most of us Americans. Um, I would say that um, most people take about two to three years to get to the minimum level to be able to, to train in the right seat and probably another good year after that. And it varies widely. You know, it, we, we don't pick, at least we hadn't picked people for the language abilities before. So training, um, you know, mid-30 to 40-year-old folks in other language is not easy. This picture is of me taking an exam. Um, so they bring in the specialist from Energia, who is a, the manufacturer of their hardware, and they come and they basically, it's, it's all done, it's an oral exam. And um, what's interesting is the, the people that teach you, the instructors, are not from Energia, they're from the Cosmonaut Training Center, and it's almost like they're your defense lawyer at a trial. And so they want you to succeed. So as much grief as they give you during the training thing, the last couple of days, they're filling you full of answers. And they hope that you get it right. And this is my, my last exam there. And this is, I mean, I literally, I, I made the um, trial analogy. And it's pretty close because you, you're almost on a witness stand. And this guy's reading me my verdict. And thankfully, I passed. And um, it, this class happens to be called, uh, I, I'm trying to get the translation, um, basically navigation system, digital navigation system. And it's considered the toughest class there. And they say that once you finish that class, then you can get married. <laughs> so since your professors did such a great job of training you, it's not unusual to break out the vodka, which is not um, an unusual thing there. It doesn't happen very often at JSC, but... And I, I didn't mention, I'm wearing my military uniform. It's a military base where you do the training, and uh, I was active duty back then. It's not required, but I, I really felt proud of the fact that I represented the U.S. Navy there. And it was pretty interesting to wear my Navy uniform in amongst all these uh, Russian Air Force officers. So once the um, theoretical training is over, we do a lot of training inside the Soyuz capsule. This is what it looks like. Uh, it's not very big, as you can see. It's uh, three people, as I said. Uh, pretty old technology. Um, in fact, this vehicle in one form or another has been flying since the mid-60s. And there are some layers of uh, IT sort of on top of it, but the basic fundamental control system is all based on relays. And by the way, you have to, under, you have to be able to draw a picture of a relay to, um, to pass an exam there. So imagine how important that is in order to be able to fly a space vehicle. It isn't, if you're wondering. So we do some of these things uh, in plain clothes, and then we do some of them suited. This is a Sokol suit, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It, there's no way to look dignified in it. You just have to hunch over. It's used for launch and entry. So there's um, another crew um, holding their Sokol suits up. Um, so Sokol suit's pretty simple. It, uh, it has a regulator, that big blue knob on the front, and um, if you, if you do nothing and the pressure outside you um, goes down, then the pressure inside will, will stay where it is until, uh, well, it will it'll decrease along with the external pressure until you get to about 0.4 atmospheres, and then it'll hold that pressure. So as you can see, it sort of, it's like blown into a, one, a surgical glove. I mean, everything goes straight, and it's pretty uncomfortable. Um, and pretty un not, it's pretty difficult to, to work in because of the delta pressure. Um, but it also serves a, some protection. So, well, let me back up. So you can, be, you can survive in vacuum. You're breathing 100% um, oxygen at this point in a 0.4 atmosphere suit, which is actually, that's quite a, a high concentration. Well, it's 100% concentration. It's a high partial pressure of atmosphere. It's plenty of oxygen for you. <clears throat> so it protects you from um, vacuum. It also, it doesn't have any real thermal protection from you, so unlike uh, the launch and entry suit that we wear on the shuttle, uh, you couldn't bail out at high altitude and expect any kind of thermal protection. It, it isn't designed for that. Um, but it does protect you pretty well for landing. The thing that they really concentrate on landing is this thing. This is a, it's called a Kazbek. It's just basically a, um, a cushion. It's a chair. Um, however, it's not quite that simple. Um, this is not a bathtub. 
uh, although it looks like one, but this is step one in making that chair. So where I'm gonna fast forward to in a minute is that when you land on your back under a parachute, um, which, is, which is landing at 10 meters per second, which is about 35 miles an hour, um, you'd, like, you'd like your weight to be distributed pretty evenly. So they make these molds per person exactly to fit your, the contours of your body, which is why you couldn't really change out the crew members on the last day because everybody has a different um, seat mold. So this is how the seat mold is made. I, I, there are going to be a lot of pictures, undignified pictures of me in this thing, but this is one of them. So they dress you up in this getup, and I'm not really sure why it looks like that. Um, I mean, they could have given you some pants, but your pants aren't important here because they're not in the, in the bathtub. So you get in there and you lie down, and then they literally pour this stuff around your body. I think it's gypsum or something that, that hardens pretty quickly. And, um, you know, there's not much to do for a little while while it hardens, and then you get hoisted out of there, which you didn't know you had to be a gymnast, too, to be an um, astronaut. It's kind of our version of the Iron Cross. That guy in the right there with the beard has, I think he poured Yuri Gagarin seed mold, I'm not sure, but he's been doing this for a long time. He's quite an artist. Then they go to work, and I don't know exactly how they know what they're doing. If they could do this, I'm not sure why you have to lay in the gypsum to begin with, but they start shaving stuff where they think it has to be done. I mean, what's interesting is that you, you're in that thing basically naked except for the small uh, T-shirt basically that you're wearing. Um, but when you land, you're going to be wearing the Sokol suit. So they must, this is what they're doing here is accommodating the difference between your, your T-shirt body and your Sokol suit wearing body. So then you get in the Sokol suit. Um, it's pretty interesting. It, it's a front entry. And the way that it works is that thing that I'm pulling up around me, in fact, um, this is a better picture of it, and now it's hanging down in front of my face, is the pressure bladder. So you, you, um, you sort of crawl in through the front and you put your feet and your arms in and then you have to poke your head from sort of forward to back around the neck ring. So it's a little like, bit like being born backwards, and, which is not terribly easy if, uh, when, for taller people. And then that bladder hold, uh, is, hangs down in front, and what's interesting is they just grab it and they kind of wrap it up like you would a trash bag, and they literally wrap a rubber band around it, and you're done. And when it pressurizes, you know, the pressure forces uh, against all those wrinkles, and it's a perfectly sealed uh, unit. Super simple. I mean, it's just like I'm sure everybody has heard the... the I don't know if it's a joke. I think it's actually reality that we spent a bunch of money inventing a pen that would write in zero G because the ink wouldn't flow downhill. And um, the Russians said, well, we'll just use a pencil. <laughs> so that's very symbolic of how the Russians uh, approach things in some ways. So there you see the bladders now all kind of wrapped up and stuck in, and then they pull these zippers down. And the, the suit looks, you look a lot better in the suit when you're sitting down, by the way, than when you're standing up. So then you go back to the trapeze thing and get lowered back in there for them to do what's basically a fit check. And um, they say, where does it hurt? And that's how they fit. And then you get out and they scrape. And that's sort of the iterative process of how this thing works. But it's pretty effective. This is something that um, certainly Brian and Buzz can relate to and, and anybody who has done any um, diving. But you know, when you go in a commercial airplane, as you go up, um, the pressure outside your ears is going down, and so you equalize. And some people, you know, chew gum or they yawn or whatever. Um, on the way down, the opposite happens. For most people, it's a little more difficult coming down than it's going up. And some people actually have to pinch their nose. Um, it's called a Valsalva. So you just pinch your nose and kind of close your eyes, and I, I don't know how to describe it. Everybody's done it before. Well, when you're wearing a helmet, you can't do that, right? Because getting at your nose is ta challenging. So um, this thing is actually an American device, um, just because I was used to it and, and it was more comfortable, that um, we glue to the inside of the thing, and you basically just bury your nose in it and do the same thing. Uh, I thought this was interesting. You, I wore these boots. They were custom made for me. Um, they actually measured my feet and did all kinds of uh, um, precise design and all that, and I, I wore them for about 50 feet. 
from one place to another, and I never wore them again. I've never seen them again, and I'm sure that the Americans are paying part of that $400 million a year is going to these boots, <laughs> which are sitting somewhere in a museum. By the way, those, I, I didn't finish, but after they have the mold of you, then they take the reverse mold and they make a cushion thing that is, ends up being the seat liner, and the mold actually gets stored, and they put it on the wall, <clears throat> and it's called the Hall of Butts. <laughs> So this is me in my mold, in my flight suit. You can see how nice and white it is, um, inflated. Um, what you can't see because they're a little bit uh, obscured by my wrists uh, or wrist is the, are these knee st straps, sort of stirrups, because as you saw before, when the thing's inflated, if you don't have some way to restrain yourself, it's going to go straight out. So these belts hold you in, and between the things that are holding your knees down and the little um, heel um, restraint, I guess, you, your, your legs stay in that 90 degree position because otherwise they would go straight. And once they go straight, there's no bringing it back against uh, 0.4 atmospheres. I'm going to fashion now some other things that we get to wear. This is a Pharrell suit. It's uh, waterproof. It's, it's what we use for water survival. So if we ever um, landed in the water, which would be a pretty bad day. A little side note, by the way. I think both Buzz and Brian are Air Force officers, and um, I'm sorry about that. But um, the, the, uh, so the Russians, Soviets before them, always hired uh, Air Force. All of their cosmonauts were Air Force guys um, for some reason, and they finally hired a Navy guy. And uh, when they landed, his capsule got off course, and he landed in a lake. So they haven't done it since. <laughs> True story. This is uh, winter survival gear that you would wear um, underneath, of course, a big uh, parka. In fact, I've got a picture of some winter survival stuff coming up here. But there's a thermal underwear, a big wool sweater, um, and then this very stylish sort of jogging outfit underneath uh, the, the parka and the, the bib overalls. This thing is called a penguin suit. And I'm not kidding, but the reason that they make this thing is it has a bunch of straps and adjustments, and you put it on um, about a week or two before landing, and you gradually start cranking it down so your body shrinks back down to its normal size. So when you're in space in zero G, most people grow between one to two inches um, just because uh, your spinal column extends. And um, because of the precise measurements of the, of the suit liner and the suits, you can't afford to be two inches taller. So their approach to this is to squeeze you into this thing and basically torture you for the last two weeks <laughs> by cinching you down. So the American uh, medical community does not buy this approach. And although we don't use the penguin suit, they make us, uh, they sell it to us for a very expensive price, I'm sure. I had three of them on board, and I never used any of them. Um, switching to a, yet a different kind of suit, this is the Orlan suit, um, which is their extravehicular activity suit. So the, this is probably one of the best training um, modalities that they have in Star City. And what it is is a, it's basically from the time you wake up on EVA day until the time you actually go outside, you go through all the steps in a real, um, wearing real suits, and it's, it's not at vacuum, but because you can inflate the suit, the delta P between you and outside is the same. You manipulate all the same equipment. Um, the suits are very heavy, so you see they have load relief here, so you have, you know, sort of like, it's one-sixth gravity about, like on the moon, coincidentally, but you can kind of walk around and stuff. And it's really excellent uh, training. That it's a, it's a capability we don't have in Houston. So they give you a brief, and then they, um, you run through all the pre-flight checks that you would on orbit, um, checking out the suits, checking out the uh, depressed equipment, et cetera. And then you get in. So in the U.S., we wear a, a garment called the liquid cooling and ventilation garment, and, and it looks a lot like this. It's basically a suit that has um, some small tubes sewn into it, and in those tubes, water is circulated, and you can adjust the temperature of the water, which can remove the heat that you build up. So it's pretty cold in space um, at nighttime, and it's pretty warm in space in the day. Um, and so the thermal... Um, conditions are pretty important. Surprisingly, the suit is so well insulated that what really drives your temperature 
um, f sense of temperature is how hard you're working. So the harder you work, uh, the more cooling you need, obviously, and it's pretty dramatic. I mean, you can get ahead of it and, um, and, and, and get yourself kind of overheated. Um, and if you have it regulated incorrectly, you can also get extremely cold very quickly. On the US suit, we also have ventilation so that the, the um, oxygen is blown in over our foreheads in the visor, which keeps the visor clear, and then it's drawn back in through the suit through these tubes that are um, along your arms and along your legs. In the Russian suit, they don't have any kind of ventilation thing. It's only, um, it's only liquid cooling. So the result is that inside the suit, it's pretty loud because they have a very loud fan in there. Um, they also have a temperature um, probe that they, well, probe, a temperature device that they put behind your ear so that the um, surgeons can monitor your temperature. And of course, they have your um, EKG with a three lady EKG. So getting into this thing is no picnic either. They have a different way. Our suit has a waist bearing, so you basically put the pants on, then you climb underneath the hard upper torso and stick your head and your arms through there and put the helmet and the gloves. These guys, the hel helmet and the glove, basically everything's all together, but there's a trap door in the back, <clears throat> and you get in it that way. It's actually easier in 1G than in 0G because, um, well, just because you can use your weight to wiggle yourself into it. So once you, we're suited up, as I said, this kind of is a, an interesting picture that shows the two of us um, getting ready to, you know, pretend to, to depress the airlock. And here you see the airlock uh, equipment in front of us. To my left is a hatch, the external hatch. So you actually go through the um, opening of the hatch and what's that's going to feel like with the, uh, with the delta pressure that you're having to accommodate in the suit. Um, Bill MacArthur, who was the ISS commander exactly a year before I was up there, had just returned while we were doing this training, and he's holding my safety tether on the other side of that hatch. You can see I've got the hatch open. That's what's uh, open on the right. So that's the sort of prep, what we call prep and post, the pre and post um, training that we do for EVA. Um, the during the flight training is done in this um, facility, which is called the Hydro Lab. It has just a mock-up of the Russian segment. We have the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory in Houston, which is a great, gigantic swimming pool, about 200 by 100 feet by 40 feet deep. And we can have almost all of the US segment in there, including the gigantic truss, um, not in one piece, but, but separated. And the training in that facility is fantastic. Um, you know, you can't, you can't simulate uh, zero G perfectly, but neutral buoyancy is pretty darn close. The problem with the Russian facility is that they, are, they concentrate a lot on neutral buoyancy, meaning you don't sink and you don't float, but the suit always wants to be in the orientation that you see in this picture. So when you, try, when you get away from that orientation, um, you have writing moments that will try to return you to that. And that's very um, inappropriate because obviously in space that doesn't happen. And what happens is you get used to doing a task at a certain work site in that orientation because that's the only orientation you can maintain. It's very tiring to hold your body position against, um, against these writing moments. So you basically give up and you say, okay, I'm gonna do whatever I, I can in this position. Well, in space, that position might be completely uh, inadequate or certainly not the best. So I tell folks that, that don't have EV experience before they come here, because if you do, you can sort of do the mental gymnastics and get there, but um, if you, if you don't have EVA experience, this training can be um, almost counterproductive. A couple other things. This is a centrifuge. Um, the Soyuz entry is, uh, is a lot more sporty than the um, shuttle was. We have a, a, a G plateau that goes to about four. It lasts about a minute long. Now, the good news is they're this way Gs, not this way Gs. So you can take this way Gs. These are called Z. Z XGs as opposed to ZGs a lot better. Um, but it's still, you know, non-trivial. And so they, they do this profile so you can feel what it's going to be like. Um, if you have a, a bad day on entry and you have what they call ballistic entry, so the, the Soyuz is a capsule. It's um, CG and a center of lift do not coincide. So it actually has uh, some L over D more than a stone. Not a lot more, but a little bit more than a stone. And so we can actually... Um, 
manipulate that lift vector to, to some degree, control cross range and to a greater degree make the entry be um, along this 4G profile. In, in the ballistic sense, they give up on that. They basically say our, our computers aren't working well enough to do that, so we're just going to spin the vehicle. So what that means is a lift, lift vector goes up, then it goes down, then it goes up, and then it goes down. And the result is a much steeper entry. So first of all, you land about um, 500 kilometers short of where you're, the guys are waiting for you, which is important. And the second thing is you get about eight Gs for about a minute. So we do a landing, uh, I mean, a, a, a ballistic landing simulation. And I would show you the video of me. It's just a camera looking at it. It's not very interesting. But um, eight Gs for a minute is pretty tough. I mean, you, you know, it's a little bit hard to breathe. and. The good thing is you know you're in a centrifuge, and, and, and the bad thing is you're in a centrifuge at 8 Gs. <laughs> so they basically put you in there um, first, again, in just the flight suit and then in the regular suit. <clears throat> and off you go. So this is uh, winter survival training. Uh, we do that. They just basically take a capsule. Um, you don't have to go very far in Russia to find winter in the winter. So <laughs> just go out the back gate, and um, they drop you off there, and you, you spend 48 hours. So that, what's really amazing, you probably ha saw how small that capsule is. All this gear that I talked about, you know, the, the fashion show with the Pharrell suit, with the um, winter stuff, all of it fits in there in these tiny little um, packages. And they start this exercise with the capsule on its side, you're in your Sokol suit, all your gear is stowed the way it is. They take a blowtorch and, and heat the bottom of the, um, uh, of the capsule to simulate the heat of reentry. And so it's pretty toasty inside there. But the rule is you have to get out of your Sokol suit and into this gear inside before you open the hatch, which I think is crazy. I mean, nobody would really do that, but that's kind of a rite of passage that you have to get through. So it's, you really want to be doing this survival training with small people because it's really small. <laughs> and then we do the same kind of thing um, in, the, in, in the summertime, in, um, often in the Black Sea, but sometimes elsewhere. And basically, it's the same kind of thing. You land it in the water, you, you put that gear on, and it's even worse there because you're putting on this sort of, obviously, it's waterproof, and that means it doesn't, trend, it doesn't get rid of your, your perspiration. And it's already hot outside, so it's really hot. Um, we've taken, it's, got, it's so bad that we've actually um, instituted a regime where we, ta we swallow a temperature pill, and we have flight surgeons that can see what our core temperature is because folks can get pretty overheated. Uh, back at Star City, we have some training where they um, actually have a smoke generator inside the module. You put on a real uh, smoke um, oxygen mask. It's not an oxygen mask. Um, well, actually, it is an oxygen mask. It's a hard canister that um, when it's, once it's lit off, it produces oxygen. And, you know, the idea is to be able to find the fire. It isn't, you don't really find the fire looking for it with a flashlight. We actually have some uh, indicators, electrical indicators that show where the problems might be. But it's pretty good training. At the end of this thing, we never find the fire, and so they can actually depressurize um, the, the whole module because the thing is, is in a great big vacuum chamber. So we practice putting on our Sokol suits and um, getting ready to abandon the station while the pressure is going down around us. That's a pretty interesting um, evolution. So I don't want to make it sound like it's all bad. Um, in Star City, we probably have, uh, I would say, half a dozen crews that are training at once. Um, and when I say crews, I mean both the Russian and the, uh, we call it USOS. So the rest of the partnership is treated as a US orbital segment um, astronauts. And the, uh, the USOS folks are housed in these uh, cottages there. And it's, it's kind of, um, the Russians built them for us way back when we started the phase one program when, when we were sending our guys to Mir. Uh, they look nothing like Russian housing. It, it, it really looks like kind of an eyesore in this otherwise kind of pristine village there. Uh, but it's pretty comfortable. And there are six of these cottages, three bedrooms each. So we just basically spread out. We often have uh, communal dinners together. It's really an interesting, you know, especially when the shuttle program was going on, 
there were the um, privileged few who were flying on the shuttle and then the poor other suckers who were flying on these long duration flights. Uh, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek because uh, th there's nothing wrong with either of those, but th it's obviously a, a little bit more of a hardship to do this um, three year, two and a half to three year training program, half of it away from home than it is to do the shuttle, which was about a year and, and almost all of it there in Houston. But what was nice here is that we really got together and you really bond um, and you, you get to spend not just the time working together, you know, from eight to five or whatever, but afterward um, we would, as I said, eat together. We actually built um, a little bar downstairs in one of the cottages in the basement. And especially on Friday and Saturday nights, you go now, down there and uh, have a beer, blow off steam, watch you know, cult movies and had a pretty good time. We'd also go out of Moscow. This is the ice bar, um, which is no kidding, an ice bar with uh, gigantic bottles of, um, of, well, I imagine they're vodka. I'm not sure, made out of ice. So finally, all that ended up about two weeks prior to launch. You, you, uh, you're deemed fit to fly, and you get to go down to Red Square. You put some flowers on uh, Yuri Gagarin's uh, tomb there. Again, I'm, I'm wearing my Navy uniform in Red Square, which when I st first started Navy, wearing Navy uniforms, I didn't really think that would ever happen, <laughs> um, e except if I ejected over and landed there. Um, the gentleman on the left is Misha Mikhail Turin. He and I spent seven months aboard together, and the one in the middle is Anusha Ansari. She came up with us. Um, she spent about eight days aboard station, and then she went home with the crew that we relieved when we got there. I'm not going to talk, um, well, I'll, so let me continue. So this is a picture of Baikonur from um, space. And it's, uh, if it looks like it's in the middle of nowhere, it is. It's in Kazakhstan, which of course was a Soviet republic. That, that body of water there is called the uh, uh, Amusira. And um, bike, there's not a whole lot going on in Baikonur except space, but there's a lot of space going on. So it's an interesting place. Uh, unfortunately, we spend those two weeks in quarantine. This is a typical dinner with the prime crew and the backup crew and the flight surgeon. Uh, this crew has one American and two Russians on it on each side. The prime crew is on the right and the backup crew is on the left. Charles Simone, who's another uh, tourist who, a space flight participant, I should say, who flew up um, with the crew that relieved us and flew home with us, um, is uh, demonstrating this chair which is another thing that the Russian, I mean, the American medical uh, folks didn't buy into, but I, I think this is supposed to just, it's like practicing bleeding. So you get in it <laughs> until you get sick, so that when you get sick, you'll say, oh, I know what this feels like. <clears throat> so meanwhile, and, and that's about it. That's all we really, we do a little bit of training down there, but it really is pretty relaxing and enjoyable. Um, some people refer to it as a white collar prison, but it's, it's okay. They feed you really well. In fact, you probably don't want to eat everything that they feed you because uh, they feed you a little too well. Anyway, down the road at the same time, they're processing the Soyuz vehicle. So the Soyuz is the name of the capsule and it's also the name of the launcher, which causes some confusion. Um, here it is in the vertical, being vertic vertically integrated and then it gets stuck on the front of the rocket. <clears throat> it has three parts. Um, the part on the left is the uh, habitation compartment. The part in the middle is the descent module, and both of which are pressurized habitable volumes. And then the part starting where it turns white is, uh, is the instrument compartment where the engine is and, and the prop and that kind of things. And those are not, uh, that is not habitable. So all three pieces go up um, and only the middle piece comes down. So two days before launch, it gets put on a train and rolled out to the launch pad. This is an interesting photo that shows kind of some of the decay, both in the foreground and in the background, and then this um, uh, pretty impressive rocket that's being pulled by something that looks like it's out of Thomas the Train. <laughs> it has more engines than Falcon 9, even. The, state, the core stages are all identical, so the, the strap-ons come off after about two minutes, just like uh, on the shuttle. But all four are, or all five, I should say, are the same. This is the front. It, the, obviously, the capsule is covered with a shroud. It has a polar ejection system, which we get rid of once we're out of the atmosphere. 
And so it rolls horizontally to the pad, um, back, backed up, obviously, back in first. And then it's um, in an amazing thing, which, uh, you know, I guess most rockets that are horizontally integrated have to do this at some point. But it gets uh, sort of, I hate to say it, but the word is erected. And um, <clears throat> this, this launch pad is called Gagarinsky Start. So this is actually where Yuri Gagarin launched from, the very same launch pad. So they basically put this, the back end, you know, right where it needs to go, and they start cranking it up, and it comes down closer and closer. These pictures are obviously taken from inside. Uh, clearances are pretty tight. And that's what it looks like when it's uh, finally vertically installed. So at this point, um, that's, what it, that's sort of what it looks like from the train track, obviously. At this point, a guy comes out, uh, a priest, and he blesses the rocket, which is a tradition that started a long time ago. Um, and has one thing about the Russians is if a tradition works, they stick with it. So you probably know the most famous one is that on the, on the, launch, uh, on the way out to the launch pad, Yuri Gagarin had to go. So they stopped the van, and he got out, and he urinated on the right rear tire. Well, guess what? Every single cosmonaut that's launched since then has gotten out at that same spot and urinated on the right rear tire. <laughs> Except Anusha. She did not do that. <laughs> this is just a really cool picture. Um, right before launch, the, um, the, all those service towers fall away. And this is a time-lapse photo photography of that. But I, I got a little bit ahead of myself. We're not at launch yet. So now launch morning, uh, which could be any time of day, happens. Uh, you wake up, they give you an alcohol bath. They give you an enema if you want one. Um, and you put on um, some uh, you know, very sterile sort of underwear, put on your flight suit, and then when you get out, you sign the door because you guessed it, Yuri Gagarin signed his door. Um, Right before that, you have a little toasting ceremony. So they bring out some champagne, and uh, your spouse is allowed in there. So the prime crew, the backup crew, and some Russian management, usually some U.S. management. And, you, you know, you don't really drink very much. Um, but you do make some toast to a lot of things that are kind of traditional in a certain order. And then, and of course, nobody briefs you on this until the first time. At some point, right before you're going to leave, the Russians all sit down on the floor and the Americans are standing around going, why are they sitting down? So you just sit down because you get used to that sort of thing. And then you stand back up and you walk out. And again, at some point they did that and it worked. And then the last guy out <laughs> takes a shot glass um, that you've been drinking champagne from and throws it on the ground and breaks it. Same thing, which is the first time you've heard that is will get your attention. So then you sign the door and then the same priest comes out and blesses you. And this isn't sort of a little dabbling holy water. This is a full-on shower, <laughs> which is pretty interesting. But um, it, it's a very sacred tradition, and, and they take it very seriously. So this is the suit-up building, uh, building 254. This is where the crew is going to come out. You see they've got a, just a generic uh, um, Kazbek there to, to do pressure checks. And the crew comes out and they chat with the folks. There's Everybody's behind the glass. So in the front row is all the Russian officials, and then the next row are the families, and then the third row is whoever else can, you know, wangle their way in there. And during all this time, one by one, each of the crew goes in and closes their visor, puts on their gloves, and, and gets pumped up to make sure that their suit is, in fact, uh, hermetically sealed. Then it's time for speeches. Um, the Russians are, are big into that. They have a specific order that they go through. Uh, the, they love it when the Americans speak Russian back to them, even if it's you know, not very good. They really appreciate the, the effort that we're making. Here's Misha and uh, Anusha and I getting ready to go. And then we, we take this trip that I mentioned um, after the, the small pause there <clears throat> to the launch pad. Very different from KSC. When you go to launch on the shuttle, there are exactly seven plus however many crew members um, that are within three miles of the shuttle. That's it. Here, it looks like uh, a tailgater. I mean, there are people <laughs> in all manner of uh, disguises, and, and uh, you know, some are wearing suits, some are, some are wearing athletic clothes. You, you can't tell who's official, who's not. So it's a really, it's a much more familial, um, cordial, collegial kind of uh, send-off. 
So I skipped the whole launch thing because you've probably seen a lot of pictures of that. I think we're running a little bit on, short on time. I just want to get through the landing because the landing is interesting. This is a, a similar time lapse photography from space. Um, so my our buddy Don Pettit is up there right now. He's a big photographer, and um, he you can't take real time lapse photography with digital cameras because the CCDs are usually um, corrupt to the point that you know one or two pixels will show up over time. So he tricked it into taking multiple long, short, short long duration exposures and then using software to put it together. So this is basically um, what the star pattern looks like as you're going around the earth. Um, they're making these interesting circle things. This is landing. So the guys are on board getting ready to land and the crew that's going to recover them deploy to these places that if you think Baikonur is in the middle of nowhere, Arkalik is really in the middle of nowhere. Um, there are four different launches and landings every year, so sometimes it's beautiful summertime, sometimes it's like this. And uh, I have a few pictures of the like this condition, so that's just snow piled up. Um, the, as I said, the parachute opens, first of all, I've described this entry as being um, a series of explosions followed by a car crash. <laughs> so there, the, the, the 4G part of it is the least of your worries. I mean, it, there's a lot of rumbling and vibration during that 4G, but finally, you start at about 10,000 feet, you start bringing the, um, the parachutes out. I, correct me, I think it's 10,000 meters, not feet. And so the, there's a drogue chute, then there's a pilot chute, then there's the main chute, which then has a reef, and then there's a, a maneuver that basically makes it go from being suspended in one point to more of a bridal arrangement. And all those things sound like World War III and feel like it too. Finally, you get under the chute and it's relatively stable and it seems to take forever to come down. So much so that these, most times, even though you're in a capsule and it's pretty hard to predict exactly where you're going to land, the uh, helicopters will get with pretty close to you and be able to take footage of you uh, on your way down. Um, that big puff down there is, is not just dirt flying from the impact. There's actually so-called soft landing jets, and I mean so-called because they're not terribly soft in my opinion, but they fire with a radio altimeter, um, radar altimeter. As soon as you get within about a meter or so of the ground, these jets fire to slow you down. But the car crash part comes when you land because it really feels like you've been rear-ended. I mean, it's, it's pretty violent. And then almost always there's some wind component. And so what happens then is that as soon as you hit and you bounce up a little bit, the parachute will drag you over on your side. So it's like being pushed into the intersection by the guy that rear-ended you and then T-boned by the guy that... <laughs> <clears throat> and this is what the landing operation looked like. So that's the capsule on the left with uh, the first helo that's on the deck there with all the... They're starting to set up all the support equipment. And uh, they usually deploy about eight helicopters and a few of these uh, ATV all-terrain vehicles. Um, this is what the capsule looks like. This is why it's hard to get changed in there. But you see... All the stuff that you see attached with the yellowish uh, cords, those are the, that's the survival equipment. And unfortunately, the hatch opens in. So first of all, the seat strokes up before you land, so you have a little bit more um, shock absorption. There's like a shock absorber on the back of the seat. So it comes up, but it never goes back down. So that takes away some volume. And then they open the hatch. And I thought they were going to have to get the jaws of life to get me out of there, because it's really small. And they roll the capsule manually, so the gauges just get behind it and they, and they roll the thing until it's in the right orientation. And they, they basically drag you out and they put you in these um, chairs and, and they cover you with blankets and, um, you know, depending on the weather. In this particular case, it was so bad that they didn't even bother with the medical tent. Usually they'll get everybody here and they'll take some pictures and you don't feel like crap, really. And they... Um, you know, so, but you smile and they, they take you and they carry you off to a medical tent where you get changed into a regular flight suit and then you board the helicopter to go back. This was so bad that they didn't even do that. They just got them, put them right on the helicopter in their Sokol suits. And this is um, a picture of the uh, ATV. In this particular case, the weather was so bad that the helos couldn't even make it there. So that's one thing that's, I mean, the Russian program is extremely robust. It's raining, it's snowing, no big deal, we'll get them. And they do, they land uh, in almost anything kind of like the US mail. And 
I thought this was a nice picture. You can see there, um, right here is where the capsule landed. This is a capsule, and you can see which way the wind was blowing. And this is the, obviously all the vehicles as they arrived. I think that may be it. It is. And I don't know, Paul, how are we doing on time? Paul says we have time for two questions. <laughs> you usually have the first one. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm getting so one question is if there is one. If there isn't, that's okay. Yes, sir. You were first. You're an American, and you're in the Star City for been training for three years. Let's say you're single. Are you allowed to date Russian women? <laughs> so the question is, if you're in Star City for three years and you're single, you're allowed to date Russian women. Uh, of course you are. Um, <laughs> first of all, I should, I, I don't know if I misled you, but you don't spend a lot of time continuously. So that you usually go there um, every other month for about a month. So it's one month there, one month home. Um, but yeah, it, there aren't very many single astronauts, but uh, those that are are free to pursue whatever they like, you know, after school, so to speak. <laughs> yes, sir, Buzz, I got to ask. Having gone through this procedure once, why in the hell would you ever volunteer to <laughs> Well, you notice I didn't. <laughs> Well, thanks. Thanks, Michael. And uh, we'd like to present this token for our appreciation. We really appreciate your talk, and we really appreciate what you all are doing for today's programming. Um, the commercial track is really going to be a good one if you can stop in and check that one out. And um, we, we appreciate your support and look forward to working with you um, as president of Commercial uh, Space Flight Federation and working to the goal of a spacecraft that you only have to speak English on. And so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move right on into the uh, afternoon tracks. Thank you.